I am flying solo on this introduction, so if I don't do as good a job as Jeff does, please excuse me. My mind's usually on the content. Uh, here we are in March, which is insane to me, the fact that it's already March. Uh, time's clipping on. But on the good side, it means we're into another month of topic focus. And this month, selfishly, personally, probably going to be my favorite month of the entire year. Why? Because I get to talk about the nervous system and neurological support through the nervous system. I believe it was early last year or part, probably even the year prior actually at this point, where we started um, the conversation around the gut brain axis. And if you haven't watched that one, it is definitely able to be viewed on our website. It's a good primer for this. I'm going to assume a little bit more knowledge and understanding at this point, because the gut brain axis is pretty simple and it's basic fundamental explanation. It's the communication point between what's going on in the gut and how it affects the brain and how the communication from what's going on in the brain influences the gut. Once you've understood that, that's the simple part. The complexity then becomes, okay, if I'm dealing with a client who has some sort of neurological challenge, chronic degenerative condition, in order to better understand their condition, I need to understand the nuance and the specifics in relation to how the gut-brain axis and its relationship with the nervous system can evolve. And beyond simple supplementation for specific parts of the body, how can I be more clinically relevant in understanding and patterning the relationship between the two? So without further ado, we're going to get into the first part of this today, which is essentially knowing the fundamental basic structure and function of the nervous system, because we really need to understand how this whole thing comes together. And it's incredibly fascinating. So I hope you'll all take some of the passion that I have for this topic, bite a little bit of, of it off, bite off more than you can chew, so to speak, and keep chewing. So it really starts with the brain. And the brain arguably is the most complex organ of the body, but the brain is very interesting because to me... I look at the brain in a similar way to, you know, the processor in a computer. The brain's main job um, is to organize and keep our physiology functioning and able to interact with its external and internal environment. So the brain is taking the sum of all the internal influences of what's going on within our physiology, keeping track of them, as well as the external influences of where we bring ourselves in the world environmentally, and organizing an appropriate response. And how that response is organized is based upon the kind of stimuli we're subjecting ourselves to and the part of the brain that needs to operate and regulate that kind of stimuli. You know, if it's critical thinking and problem solving in the form of a Sudoku puzzle, that's a lot of frontal lobe stuff. It's a lot of prefrontal cortex stuff. If we're listening to music or playing music and, and listening for feedback, that's the auditory center. So different areas of the brain have specific functions that have to interrelate because remember, there's the sequences of firing within the neurons that determines the output. So if you think about that from a, a perspective, it's so interesting that the ability to reach for a glass on the table and pick it up is nothing more than a series of sequences of firing in the brain that's called a neural network. The more we fire neural networks, the stronger those connections get. And this is the neuroplasticity of the brain and the nervous system via learning. Conversely, knowing that the brain is segmented and separated into different areas, if someone is having a specific issue within their neurological system and we understand the, the specifics of the issue and the brain anatomy, we know what part of the brain is hypofunctioning. And typically that could be as a result of a previous injury, um, an immune process in the brain, a lack of blood flow, uh, a cleaving of these neuroplastic connections in the networks. So if you understand your functional neurology, which is something I'm getting into myself, it can give you a very practical understanding of what's going on within the body via the brain and the anatomy, but also a really good theoretical basis and fundamental understanding of the same thing. So if we know that the brain is a command center, I look at the nervous system as the communication hub. And how our nervous system is essentially set up is information coming from the periphery, outside world, comes in to the peripheral nerves. That peripheral nerve pathway sends information to the processor, the brain and the spinal cord, or the central nervous system via the brain and the spinal cord. The brain analyzes, figures out an appropriate response, 
sends the information back to the periphery and ultimately sends it where it wants it to go to create the ability to control a conscious activity. So when you go for a run, that is a conscious activity that you need to make sure that your legs are moving left, right, left, right. If you only move your right leg, you'll probably spin in a circle. And then the autonomic side of things, when that run is happening, you don't have to think about breathing, you breathe automatically. Your heart doesn't have to think about beating. Your body and your physiology are controlling the autonomic function of a beating heart. So it's a very int intricately designed system with information coming in, getting processed, analyzed, and orchestrated outcome is organized, and it sends that response back down the brain to the peripheral nerves, and your body and your physiology simply know what to do. So when people talk about different parts of the nervous system, it's very important to understand what they do so you can have that foundational understanding and integrate this understanding into a client intake session to maybe assess something. So the central nervous system arguably is the most important part because this is where all the processing happens. It's the brain, the spinal cord, um, the optic nerves, so the eyes, and, and, and for the most part, everything in the head even underneath um, the blood-brain barrier where you have the olfactory bulb, the brain stem, which is what interprets uh, our ability to recognize sense, all of these things are fundamental aspects of structure, of the central nervous system, and their components, the neurons and the glial cells, uh, those are the connections and the glial cells are essentially non-neuronal tissue in the brain that are there to deal with potential threats and responses. So if anyone's ever had a concussion, they cause glial activation. If anyone ever experiences brain fog or the ability to feel foggy and not have the ability to recall quick word choice and memories from a short-term perspective, it's likely that your neurons are suffering in their ability to sequence those connections because the immune-mediated cells of your brain, the glial cells, are for some reason raising the inflammatory alarm because there's a strong immune connection to the glial cells. The brain's main job is essentially an intake system. So the information coming in from all the sensory nerves comes into the brain. The brain, in quick blinks of the eye, beyond the, the speed you can even comprehend, initiates an appropriate response. And that's why if you're about to get hit by a car, you don't have to think about jumping out of the way. The brain just moves you specifically via the peripheral system, which is the second part. So when we're talking about the nervous system, all that is not the brain and the spinal cord technically is the peripheral nervous system. So all the nerves that branch out of the spinal cord, whether they innervate the skeletal muscles or they innervate all the organs below the neck, it's all part of the peripheral nervous system. And what this does is it receives the information that the central nervous system is organized and sends it all to the appropriate areas for the action that the physiology is required to do. So, you know, essentially it brings the information through the sensory to the central nervous system and back out and orchestrates a response via what's called the motor division. The nervous system has a sensory division, sensing, motor division, action. And with the peripheral nervous system, there's two main targets. And, and one of them is essentially more important to know about from a clinical physiologic perspective. And those targets are either the skeletal muscles, which are voluntary, or the autonomic nervous system, and in this case, autonomic means involuntary. And we've talked about this before, and with the rise of heart rate variability and various other measuring tools that you can use both personally and clinically, the autonomic nervous system is a very, very important piece of the puzzle from a clinical perspective, especially for gaining insights into the overall health of someone's physiology. Because the main function of the autonomic nervous system is to regulate all aspects of all those involuntary processes within the physiology. Meaning you don't have to think about blinking your eyes a certain number of times in the day. Your body will do it naturally to moisten your eyes to maintain vision. All of these things have to be either controlled and influenced by the parasympathetic or sympathetic divisions. And the relationship of these two must be balanced. So in this case, the autonomic system takes the motor inputs, the action desiring or the action potential inputs from the central nervous system, and it's an intermediary between here and the gut. So when we're talking about the gut-brain axis, what we're really talking about is what happens from the brain and the spinal cord that gets sent down to the autonomic nervous system. Because if you look a little bit lower down on this example, the autonomic nervous system connects to the enteric nervous system. 
And when it comes to the concept of balance, how I explain the autonomic nervous system to clients is the difference between a gas pedal and a brake pedal. If you drive around flooring the gas pedal all the time, that is a very sympathetic dominant way of existing. Conversely, if you hit the brake pedal, it slows things down. It's a very parasympathetic, parasympathetic way of living. There's a lot of sound bites in the health world that say, oh, we have to get into parasympathetics. We have to be parasympathetic all the time. If you understand a little bit about how the autonomic nervous system functions, you can't be all one or the other. If it is imbalanced, then it's also not optimal. If someone is chronically parasympathetic, they're on bed rest because they're so exhausted. If someone is chronically sympathetic, they are, you know, three times caffeinated and they've been shot with an adrenaline needle. There's too much energy resources being utilized. The balance between the two of these, which we'll look at later, is a really good way to assess someone, not only from a global health perspective, but to understand what degree of neurological dysfunction and patterns they may be existing in based upon the results of testing. Oh, come on. There we go. So now we get down to the gut again, because the enteric nervous system in some ways is the deepest aspect of the peripheral nervous system. So the enteric nervous system is an extension of what we just talked about, the autonomic, which is the sympathetic parasympathetic. And what the enteric nervous system essentially does is it innervates two layers of the gut. It innervates the muscular layers, that which controls peristalsis, the, the smooth rhythmic contraction of the smooth muscles in the gut that allow for the appropriate speed of passage of food contents through the digestive system into the waste. And then it also innervates the mucosal layer. And we have to understand that the mucosal layer of the enteric nervous system controls a multitude of things. Digestive secretions, so your hydrochloric acids, your you know, systemic um, brush border enzymes, not systemic rather, your brush border digestive enzymes that ultimately finish the last step of digestion. The ability for your goblet cells in your colon to secrete mucus to renew the mucosal layer. The enteric nervous system uses every single neurotransmitter that the brain does. And when people say, you know, 90% of the serotonin in your body is produced in the gut, um, although an approximation, that is true because the chemical soup, so to speak, of neurotransmitters at the gut level greatly influence not only the activity of the enteric nervous system, i.e. the optimal performance of digestion, absorption, and waste removal, but it also influences the ability to communicate back up to the brain when things need to change. If you experience a digestive infection, your enteric nervous system will immediately start to release various compounds to upregulate the production and release of antimicrobial peptide compounds. It will change the microbiome and change the immune function at the local gut level in order to try to intervene with a pathogen. And it will also produce a lot of excessive mucus and potentially get things moving through you really quickly to remove the threat of the gut. But we talk about the gut so often, and I think in commonplace language, we talk about things like digestion and dysbiosis and immune activation. And we forget there's 80 billion different neurons in the gut that all have to intercoordinate properly with not only within the gut, but within the entire autonomic nervous system and the brain. So you can see if someone doesn't have sympathetic parasympathetic balance because the heart beating, you know, the, the love dub of the heartbeat is both sympathetic and parasympathetic. If they're imbalanced, the entire communication pathway to the enteric nervous system becomes compromised. And what's really interesting is if you were to cut the vagus nerve, which is the main division of communication that comes from the brain down to the enteric nervous system, it's the only nervous system in the body that can work independently of the central nervous system because it has both sensory and motor divisions in and of itself. So the gut has the ability to think by itself. And for me, that makes me rethink the concept of a gut feeling you have about someone or something because the nervous system is always taking in and processing information. So I think that's a really important aspect when it comes not only to your own clinical intuition with something, but teaching people how to get into balancing their nervous systems and getting more body awareness is very important for the maintenance and optimal production of long-term health. So this is how the whole thing comes together. It's a very quick snapshot of everything that I explained, and it's up here just for everyone to get a, a better relationship with understanding the different routes and communication points. If you notice the bottom blue star, 
the yellow is the sensory division, the blue is the motor division. And as I mentioned before, the enteric nervous system, the gut brain, is the only one that can actually autonomically think and take care of itself, even if the, the connection between the brain was severed. If that doesn't give you indications as to how important the ability to maintain good functioning digestive health is, I really don't know what does. So now that we have a baseline understanding of the structure and function of the systems, well, if you're dealing with someone with a neurological condition, or if you want to assess someone's gut issue based upon understanding what their nervous system is telling you, I think some sort of nervous system assess assessment is absolutely essential. There's so many different wearable devices nowadays, and they spout this concept of heart rate variability. And most people don't really know how to explain heart rate variability. The heart is not meant to be a metronome. Every single heartbeat technically is and should be different. And what heart rate variability is doing is it's me measuring from a time perspective the variance between each interbeat interval. So if someone's resting heart rate is 60 beats per minute, those 60 beats are not going to be evenly spaced. The greater the degree of time between beat one and beat two, and an additional difference in time between three and four, so on and so forth, indicates how well the autonomic nervous system is functioning, because the heart and the brain are always communicating to regulate things like blood pressure, cardiovascular dynamics, and the movement of fluids throughout the system. Why this matters clinically is, if you have the ability to assess someone's heart rate variability through a various um, means of testing, you can start to figure out what state their system is in and how you may want to proceed with treating that person or creating some sort of protocol. We can talk about this at the end if anyone's, anyone has any questions and answers. Because the relationship between the two tells you a lot about system-wide health, especially from a gut perspective, because we know that most of digestion is parasympathetic. 70% of the innervations in the enteric nervous system come from the parasympathetic division, specifically the vagus nerve. And when we're measuring the contribution of sympathetic and parasympathetic on a heart rate variability test, we're basically looking at, does the person have the ability to express health? Because a high parasympathetic tone, to me, shows a great potential for anabolism. The body is able to build itself up. Why? Because it has good amounts of energy available to it, and there's a lot of adaptability in the system. Of course, because parasympathetic is rest and digest, so it is the default dominant state you want the body to have access to. If someone is highly sympathetically driven because of a variety of external and internal stressors, and this is important to distinguish, if someone doesn't have conscious stress in their lives externally, but their physiology is an inflammatory mess, to the physiology that is a stress. And as a result of that stress, they have increased sympathetic involvement, which means they have a greater utilization of energy, they're more catabolic. And as a result of that, they have less adaptability. So therefore, they have less they can tolerate before their body falls apart from a physiologic perspective. Why is this important from a gut perspective? Well, if 70% of the innervations in the enteric nervous system that supply secretions, that regulate peristalsis, that regulate bowel movement frequencies, if those divisions are downregulated because of chronic stress and we have a high sympathetic tone, last time I checked, fight or flight doesn't allow for us to digest our food properly because it's a hazard to our well-being. So if clients come in and you're doing some sort of a heart rate variability assessment such as this, you can start to understand the patterns of how the heartbeat connects to different autonomic nervous system subtypes, and you can make inferences based upon how their heart rate variability may be impacting their gut. If they're highly sympathetically driven, are they experiencing maldigestion? Are they experiencing bloating, abdominal distension? Do they alter between constipation and excessively frequent bowel movements? Do they have the ability to digest large meals or do they have to eat small meals or else it overwhelms their stomach and they get gastric reflux? Once you start utilizing this and understanding the connection pathways between how the nervous system is trying to regulate everything and how the physiology is ultimately presenting itself and responding, 
it becomes such a benefit to know what supplements and what interventions may be most opportunely used right now. And what's even cooler is you can give someone some sort of supplemental intervention and look at how their heart rate variability may change in order to see if you're on the right track with them. Because when you map HRV and the associated ANS responses, you start to get some insights. So if someone is sympathetically dominant, their, their body's stuck in a stress response, they have less adaptability. And what this looks like is a higher heart rate and less time variability between each heart rate. More often than not, those people are chronically inflamed. They have chronic dysbiosis because they don't have proper gut-brain signaling. And as a result, they have GI distress and compromise. They can't digest things properly because if you can't recruit the vagus nerve, ideally with vagal tone, how can you get the proper signals from the brain down to the gut? Conversely, these people also may develop things like leaky gut. So brain inflammation typically follows path because leaky gut, leaky brain, so they say, because it's not just via the nerves that the brain speaks to the gut. It's also via the circulatory systems. When this is happening, the body increases its toxic burden and jams up potential detoxification pathways so the person can bioaccumulate environmental toxins as well as endogenous toxins like lipo lipopolysaccharides and various other things that could be coming in from just metabolism in general. So when you're dealing with someone and you're assessing these patterns between sympathetic and parasympathetic, it's the best overall lens to ask this question. What degree of burden is the body under and what degree of adaptability does it have left? This is not the person that you're going to put on a massive detox protocol immediately because it may push them over the edge. This is a person that you're going to figure out, maybe we can make some dietary changes. We'll start with a basic plan of supplementation to help support nutritional deficiencies and digestive function. And maybe we're going to get you doing something that stimulates your parasympathetic system so we can regenerate and re-educate the body to bring you back into a state of greater balance. And what I think is kind of interesting is if you go back to those same patterns, what are the core relationships of the different neurological conditions out there? What are the variables of interplay? Well, there's inflammation, there's dysbiosis, there's GI distress, and compromised function, there's brain inflammation, there's altered detoxification pathways and chemical burdens and overload. And we didn't even get into the aspect of when the gut and the brain are healthy, how does that person present? What is their degree of vitality? What is their cognitive function like? What is their mood regulation? Do they sleep well? You know, one sign they say is a, a sign of early cognitive decline in people is when during REM sleep, our body becomes paralyzed so we don't act out our dreams. So if someone starts to become highly active during REM sleep, they're losing that ability to experience body paralysis and they act out their dreams. That's an inflamed brain. That's a brain that's developing a pathway to early cognitive decline. And the question is, well, what can we do about it? How do you treat that? And since I let go of treating the condition and treating the physiology and measuring what the physiology is telling me, not only has it relieved any stresses of not being able to execute and help the person, when you don't treat the condition, but you balance the physiology, I find often the condition starts to go away because the body just expresses these scenarios of compensation as conscious choices. If you take away the conscious choice to do that because you've increased energy and adaptability and reduced the burden on the body, what was in process as a potential diagnosis can finally alleviate itself and it can go away. And this is true of all tissues. You know, where there is a, an artery, there is a vein. Where there is that, there is a lymphatic vesicle. Where there is that, there is a neuron. So the body is always in chronic and constant communication with itself to chronically and you know, perpetually figure out how do I adjust to deal with the inputs in the here and now of external and internal source. The body is not a linear thing. It is a very open system. And because of that, you know, it'd be easier if it were a linear system for us as clinicians because there would only be so many different options available. But because of all the things that can happen in a very spontaneous or instantaneous way, the body has to has, have all of these sensory and information input systems dispersed through all the different tissues, cells, and connective tissue intermediaries in the body. 
And this is why something like assessing the nervous system is a very good way to globally figure out what's going on with the body. So then you can understand the connection to each of the organs involved in the diagnosis of what that person is dealing with and how you may want to go about initiating a treatment plan. And from there, it allows you to get into a little deeper insights based upon the chronic inflammatory stuff that we're seeing nowadays as clinicians. And next month, we're going to be getting into some immune stuff. But, so I thought it'd be a really good thing to introduce some things conceptually to put it all on your radars, because if you are dealing with a lot of immune compromised people and you want greater insights of how all of this stuff comes together, once you make those connections and start to understand some of these patterns, it makes you very powerful in terms of your ability to positively affect what's going on. So there is a field of neuroimmunology. It's a very wordy slide. I'm going to let most of you examine it on your free time. But this looks at all the different potential interaction pathways of how the immune system can negatively affect the nervous system. And if the immune system is having to recruit itself to go after something within the nervous system, and this will encompass things like autism spectrum disorder, various you know, youth-based clinical manifestations, as well as long-term chronic neurodegenerative aspects of life that you may see in older adults, if you understand the pathways of interaction and how fundamentally, whether it's you know immune cells going into the neuronal tissue and breaking connections, or maybe it could be you know the activation of the microglia because something's getting past the blood-brain barrier, how does the nervous system and the circulatory system, such as the lymphatic system, connect? Well, the lymphatic system carries a lot of your immune cells, like B cells and T cells. So if there's something that is an active viral or bacterial infection within the nervous system, you're going to be making a lot of immune cells and that immune stress is going to deplete the body if it's a long-term thing. And then from a gut immune perspective, well, what are the mechanisms there? What kind of microbes may make certain kind of neurotransmitters that negatively impact the gut brain axis? What does fungus do? What does a viral load in the gut do? And how does that change if that load is able to leave the gut and circulate through the lymphatic systems or the circulatory system to get to the nervous system. It's a lot to think about, but it's really how systems-wide, I think, systems-wide thinking and treatment has to be when we're dealing with these conditions. Because a lot of the times, five people with the same manifestation of diagnosis had five different pathways to get there. And if you can have some greater insights and start drawing these connections, I would love to, know, to learn about it. Because fundamentally, this is how something like an infection or some kind of immune stress can get access to every possible organ. The nervous system in some ways is like a highway. And when you're looking at, you know, central nervous system degeneration and diseases, things like brain tumors, chronic degenerative conditions of both autoimmune and non-autoimmune origin, the intersection point is there's something inflammatory going on within the nervous system and the immune system is the only system in the body that can chronically raise inflammation in order to try and overwhelm an issue. So this might spark a little bit of thought process or maybe some deeper diving in any of you who are clinicians who deal with a lot of these scenarios because we really don't know how Alzheimer's starts. We really don't understand all the aspects and implications of how Parkinson's develops. The only thing we do know is when it comes to all chronic degenerative conditions, we see a down regulation in the communication within the nervous systems and symptoms that manifest in the person's body years before the disease takes hold. With Parkinson's, you see constipation, you know, five to 10 years before advanced symptoms. You also, um, see something uh, as an aggregation of protein accumulation in the gut called alpha-synuclein protein, which is there and evident before the Parkinsonian symptoms take over. Same thing with Alzheimer's. You see dysregulation of blood sugar and energy metabolism in the body. And you also are now seeing that Alzheimer's is connecting itself to viral infections, active viral infections within the brain. Uh, I very quickly did a radio segment today, and one of the, the new insights that the radio host shared is supposedly the brain has its own microbiome. So we might have to do a reverse of the gut-brain axis microbiome and investigate that, because if that's true, 
then when things fall out of balance and microbes get where they're not meant to go or they overgrow in various um, sites in the body and populations, then you can understand that these chronic degenerative conditions are actually the body trying to protect itself from some degree of threat. We haven't even talked about chemical toxic burden. Besides HRV, there are other things we can do. You can do a variety of functional labs and get insights based upon correlating the markers of dysfunction with specific areas in the body and how they may have systemic impacts. Organic acid tests are wonderful snapshots to figure out what may be floating around in the body that the body's having to detoxify. And if it's doing so in increased levels, well, is that creating some sort of systemic problem that's increasing toxic burden, uh, dropping pH and compromising energy production? When you understand that all of these things are interconnected, you know, the, I've said many times over, we start as one cell that becomes two, that becomes four. When there is a degree of compromise within the nervous system or the gut brain axis, it is a body wide problem, but it is showing up in a specific area of tissue within the body. And if we can reverse engineer some of these scenarios and get good diagnostics and understand the patterns, it allows us to be guided as to where we want to go as clinicians when it comes to our decision making process. And all of a sudden, the science of medicine becomes the art of client and patient care because it's gathering all the different aspects and insights that we can to create a plan for that person that's a unique plan that's meant for them as an individual because no two conditions are the same. So for coming back to the gut brain, now we know that there's a top down and a bottom up communication via the vagus nerve. Think about what the brain and the nervous system experiences under conditions of leaky gut. Because anything that gets out of the gut then gets into circulation has a neuron modifying effect. And oftentimes, you know, we may be seeing the outcome of something neurologically driven that is actually of gut origin because the ability for the microbes and the microbiome to modulate the CNS is very, very numerous. Now, if someone's chronically inflamed, they're gonna be going down the HPA axis pathway, which downregulates the vagus nerve and upregulates the sympathetic side because of the need for adrenaline and cortisol to be an anti-inflammatory substance. What is that gonna do? That's gonna increase or imbalance the neurotransmitter synthesis. GABA is gonna go down, glutamate's gonna go up, and we're gonna reduce the production of this thing called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is a stimulation of neuroplasticity and high BDNF is correlated with healthy aging, especially from a cognitive perspective. So as a result of that, we've caused issues with the vagus nerve. <clears throat> we dysregulated the gut and promoted dysbiosis, imbalanced short-chain fatty acid production. Therefore, the intestinal barrier and the metabolic aspect of things becomes changed. And therefore, the immune system is going through a state of immunomodulation because of systemic wide pathogen sharing and the shaping of neural networks. Because when the body is under stress, that person's body becomes better at being stressed. It's an unfortunate thing, a thing about neurology. It's neurons that fire together, wire together. So regenerating someone who's coming back from chronic sympathetic dominance from leaky gut just got a whole lot more complicated and more complex but at least we understand the patterns are defined and they're quite clear. So I think it's important to, to denote some, some truths here. Wherever an issue manifests within the nervous system, the, sorry, the nervous system is a point of assessment and there's a pattern of a point of dysfunction. Essentially what that means is when there's an issue, you can always figure out to what degree the body is in a crisis state and to some degree, what degree of inflammation is present by the patterns that the nervous system can display through autonomic assessment. When the, when the nervous system is the organ or tissue which is compromised, you always have some degree of connection between what's going on at the gut, what's going on in the immune system, and how that's impacting the nervous system. So poor digestion, dysbiosis, gut infection, immune activation, downregulation of physical and chemical barriers, leaky gut, nervous system dysfunction. And when the nervous system is the tool that is assessing the internal state of the body, the output will always reflect the necessary change the body needs to hold things together. What does that mean practically? Someone's body doesn't just choose to be sympathetically dominant. It just doesn't choose to have some degree of nervous system dysfunction. 
it is the best possible outcome that the body can choose in that moment to keep itself going. So these people who are actually quite fragile because they have low levels of adaptability and compromised amounts of energy are the people that you start very gently with because what you want to do is increase the bandwidth of tolerance so the body has enough energy to start to heal itself. Another truth is not all central nervous system issues are gut originated. You can have something like a, a traumatic brain injury or you can have some sort of, of um, toxic exposure, but it's likely that most CNS, CNS issues are gut correlated. Why? Because if there is an issue within the nervous system, we disrupt that beautiful and elegant pathway that we spoke about early on in the lecture that regulates and intercoordinates all the wonderful aspects of a healthy digestive system. And where do you see this? You see this in a variety of different expressions. People who have things like ASD, Asperger's, anything that's on the spectrum of, I believe, what they call neurodivergence now, ADHD is one of those things, or developmental delays. They could be the body's decision that's the best possible decision given what the physiology has left to present the symptoms so this person stays alive. So knowing that, the gut becomes a more likely target of maybe being able to move the needle quite quickly without having the stress of reverse engineering the condition that the person's presenting. Because autism is a very complex thing. And we have later on this month, Dr. Kurt Wohler coming on for the masterclass to talk about that very thing. And there's a more chronic presentation. So those who are in their you know, later years in life, this is all chronic degenerative conditions. And this can be things like Alzheimer's, dementia, cognitive decline, multiple sclerosis. So the clinical relevance here is if you can assess where that person is, you can plot the pattern and the assessment of gut dysfunction. And I'm sure we've all been in this position, like what, what happens when you've tried the different protocols and the different products and for a period of time they work, but after you pull them off, all the symptoms return or the person has a relapse. This is where understanding all these connections and figuring out how to, you know, do the bed mass of the body. And what I mean by bed mass, it's the, the, the math we all tried to forget in, in either elementary or high school, where there's an order of operations of how you do things. Fortunately, neurology is a very complex topic and it's way more, way beyond what we can cover today in terms of all the nuances of it. But if we can start understanding the interrelationships between systems, and we have someone who comes in who's had gut issues for a multitude of years, they have neurological dysfunction, they have disrupted sleeping patterns, and you start working on the gut and all of a sudden they feel a lot better and they become more regular in terms of their motility and they're digesting food and they're no longer experiencing GI distress. That's a win. You may have not actually totally cured and cleared up their issue, but you've started to give the body a little bit more of what it needs in order to present more health. So when it comes to the, the final understandings of all these patterns, I think this is the last truth that I want to share with, within the context of this lecture. Outside of a TBI, I think it's safe to assume that all issues that involve the CNS have some connection to the gut, and they often show up in the gut before they do the brain. This pathway is very much defined. And what's wonderful about knowing this is if you look at all the inputs, most of them are conscious decisions or unconscious decision mediated. High levels of chronic stress, unfortunately, we can't get away from that nowadays, but it's important to understand and expand your definition of stress to not only external stress in the form of work, personal relationships, finances, things of that nature. What stresses are your is your physiology experiencing and why is the physiology experiencing stress? What's the input? You know, what is the diet load? What is the kind of food that the person's eating on a regular basis? And are they nutritionally deficient? Because that is a form of physiologic stress because the body has to compensate. Is there some sort of infectious, and I will add to this toxic load on the body, and is the body bioaccumulating these things faster than it's able to remove them? And are they, you know, unfortunately, have they been part of the system where they've had an antibiotic for every cold every year. And as a result of that, they've not only developed dysbiosis, but very much compromised immunity. And all of those things together can coalesce and create dysbiosis, which generates gut permeability. So you have various proteins and various endotoxins and exotoxins leaking into the, the circulatory systems. And if the body is inflamed at the gut level, I'm um, say it again, 
the body is likely infl inflamed at the brain level. And the brain is an organ that is 60% fat. And as a result of that, those fats are very fragile. And if they mutate or they oxidize, that neuron can't fire appropriately anymore because that neuron structurally is changed. So therefore, functionally, it's changed. So now we get into the, the tail end of this, the clinical considerations. How do you incorporate supplements into your practice knowing all this? Well, the wonderful thing is the patterns don't change from a lot of the other talks and, and topics we've covered. It's just how are you going to, to be strategic with the product that you choose and how are you going to rationalize your choice based upon understanding the interconnection aspects of the gut and the brain? I've selected three products for, for the month um, based upon knowing that they have very defined abilities to intervene at different levels, but they also coalesce with lots of other conditions. So if you're looking at doing something within the neurological realm and you want to figure out, well, do I want to start with a probiotic? My go-to would be Theralac Pro. Why? It is the best immune modulating probiotic we currently offer. And as you know, we have probiotics for specific segments of the gut, and they have different intentions as a result of their formulations. And generally speaking, if someone has a gut-wide issue, it's better to go for maximal coverage. So Theralac Pro's goal is to focus on immunomodulation in both the small and large intestine. And the one thing our probiotics do very differently that no one else has is our deep delivery and our lactostem technology. And the ability for probiotic to get through the harsh condi conditions of the stomach and arrive at the specific site of where you want the bacteria is the key differentiator in terms of the probiotic that works and one that does not. So the combination of the formula, the strain designations and the functionalities of having both pro and anti-inflammatory cytokine stimulus the ability to downregulate things like tyramines, histamines, and oxalates, which in someone who's healthy may not be a problem. But again, if we go back to the concept of the autonomic nervous system and the stress load, if someone is neurologically compromised, if they are immunocompromised, then things like histamines and oxalates may actually be too immunostimulatory and push them into an inflammatory response, as does the potential inclusion of high amounts of D-negative lactic acid. So the combinations of our strain designations, our unique technologies, and the specific defined functionalities of all the strains within Theralac Pro makes it not only one of the most powerful probiotics on the market, but a really good starting point to see if someone you're working with who is neurologically compromised receives immediate benefit from working only on the gut because the average clinician might go, well, how does, how does a probiotic intervene with cognitive decline? Or how does a probiotic basically help with ADHD? Well, if the enteric nervous system is compromised, there's dysbiosis and various other things at the gut level, this might actually create an, a calming environment and be an appropriate intervention when you're not wanting to focus specifically on the neurological system. If you do want to focus on the neurological system, we have something for that. Sun Balance is our neurologically targeted supplement aside from sun theanine. And Sun Balance was created for those who experience things like neurological inflammation, mast cell activation, because it's a combination of an antioxidant, um, a fat, soluble fat targeted antioxidant with two systemic antioxidants that work not only at the neurological level, but at a systemic level in the circulatory systems. So when someone is experiencing issues in relation to cognitive inflammation, neuroinflammation, sun balance would be my go-to to help get the brain out of crisis mode because an inflamed brain is a brain that cannot produce energy optimally. A brain that cannot produce energy optimally cannot interpret the appropriate responses coming in from the internal and external environments and organize those to proper actions that it sends out through the system. So when you're looking at something to piggyback the ability to work at the gut level, this is what I would go with because as I said before, the brain is 60% fat and PEA, the dominant ingredient in Sun Balance, acts as a very, very strong antioxidant for fatty tissue. If there is mast cell activation within the gut, it's gonna cause gut brain issues or within the brain, you want to help quell those pro-inflammatory cytokines that come from chronic mast cell activation because they have downstream consequences. 
for the most part, downstream consequences are inflammatory in nature when it comes to neurological conditions and disorders. So this would be the first choice or the first line of defense to specifically target the brain and the neurological system after working on the gut level. The third thing I would go to would be detoxification and immune support. And that the greatest thing we have for that is sulforazine, and it is unique just on the fact alone that it is actually true stabilized sulforaphane as an ingredient. We've talked about this before, but it's worth mentioning again. If someone is dealing with toxic burden and they have an accumulation of toxins in the system and they have a lack of ability to rid those toxins out of the body, those toxins have to go somewhere. And typically what the body starts doing is packing them away in either fat tissue or connective tissue. And in order to help the person rid those things, they often need detoxification support and antioxidant support, which is what sulforazine or sulforaphane does better than anything else. The way it helps to help remove toxic substances from the system is it upregulates phase two pathways of liver detoxification, specifically sulfur, sulfur oxidation, sulfation, and methylation pathways. The other thing it does is it stimulates the NRF2 pathway, which is a very fancy way of saying it stimulates the body's internal antioxidant system. When the body's inflamed, it is what called it is entered what's called a healing crisis. And what comes with a healing crisis is chronic inflammation. And that is experienced as a pro-inflammatory storm in the body where there's lots of pro-inflammatory cytokines that deplete antioxidants. When there's a lack of antioxidants present, detoxification slows down and oxidative stress takes place. So what we have here is we have gut level intervention, neurological level intervention, and detoxification level intervention based upon the three products that we've chosen. It doesn't mean this is the exhaustive list. I did want to put forth some honorable mentions because when someone comes to me with any sort of autonomic nervous system dysfunction, I immediately put the patterns together and start to think what areas in the body are compromised. And I always start with digestion first. If someone doesn't have good vagal tone signaling, I'm not going to assume it's going to happen automatically and come back overnight. So either a combination of HCL zyme and digest zyme is what I'm going to start with based upon the symptoms they tell me. And if they're chronically sympathetic dominant, they tell me they don't sleep well, they're chronically under stress. I'm going to add sun theanine to sun balance because sun theanine has the ability to potentially modulate what gets messed up in terms of neurotransmitter signaling in the brain with an upregulation of glutamate and a downregulation of GABA, why I call theanine a chill pill. Some other things you might want to think about if you're dealing with a younger population and they have a really poor diet, lots of gluten, lots of dairy because of personal choice, those foods in chronic consumption have the ability to become neuroinflammatory catalysts. And it's because we don't have the enzymes to properly break down gluten. And casein proteins have very specific chains of amino acids that essentially can become very immunostimulatory if consumed in excess. So using glutazyme on an empty stomach can be a way to help break down these immune antigen complexes, which many people who have these sensitivities are what drives the neurological response of things like brain fog, mood change, stuff of that nature. Sun fiber is another thing I would think about piggybacking off of Theralac Pro. Why? Well, if I'm giving someone probiotics and I'm not necessarily feeding those probiotics with a targeted food, their ability to bind and proliferate becomes reduced. If they don't bind and proliferate, they have a harder time crowding out the dysbiosis, whatever that may be, be it a yeast, a fungus, or a parasite. So what's different about sun fiber or any of the fibers, the true fiber of the sun spectrum, is the base sun fiber they use targets only endogenously positive bacteria, specifically the bifido. And if you're using something like a sun spectrum, you get the added benefits of the anti-inflammatory effects locally at the gut level. And then the last thing I'll say is systemic enzymes, because if someone is chronically neurologically inflamed, it's likely to assume that things that are circulating around the body have potentially gotten access to the nervous system. So what we wanna do is stop those things in their tracks and using you know, therazyme as a broad brush stroke or getting a little bit more targeted because having, having some sort of infectious condition in the specific area could be something that not only is tanking the autonomic nervous system's adaptability, 
but where there is a nidus, uh, a, a little aggregation of infection, that can translocate and become more of a systemic problem. So these are some additional honorable mentions if you want to look at it from a more global perspective when, when drawing connections. And the last thing I, I call the non-negotiables. These are the things that um, are absolutely essential to bring someone back to a state of balance from ultimate compromise. And if you look at the research around things like regular exercise and the ability to improve neuroplasticity, aging and healthy cognitive function and exercise, those three go together very, very well. Sleep is super important, not only for the quantity of sleep you need every night, but the glymphatic system, which essentially empties the garbage from the brain and the neurological system, only happens when proper sleep cycles are engaged, which means you go from REM sleep all the way down to stage four, stage five, and come back up. If for whatever reason we have compromised sleep, we go to bed too late, um, we're looking at you know the improper kind of lights and we're not honoring our circadian rhythm, if we don't get deep sleep, we don't detoxify our brains. If we don't detoxify our brains, the accumulation of toxic issues and chemicals within the brain can be a catalyst for neuroinflammation. Breathing is another thing. And when I mean breathing, I mean conscious, slow, rhythmic breathing. Why? Because it's one of the only ways you can use your own physiology to stimulate your own vagus nerve. The, the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system isn't only coming out of um, the 10th vertebrae of the neck. There's also a lower division that innervates the rectal area and is influenced by the movement of the diaphragm. When we breathe short and shallow, we're reinforcing neurological pathways that sustain sympathetic dominant behavior in the body. When we can slow our breathing down and potentially pair that with some sort of brain stimulation, um, quiet music, relaxing environments, ultimately what it allows us to do is it allows us to take our foot off of that gas pedal from a physiologic perspective, apply the brakes and get the body back out of crisis mode into a state where things can work not only more efficiently, but more effectively. Because the best supplement protocol in the world is just one aspect of treating neurological conditions and dysregulation of the gut-brain axis. We have to understand it is a system-wide thing all conditions are total body inclusions. So we have to think systems wide if we want to resolve these things from a long-term perspective. And with that, everyone, I hope that was um, a solid amount of information. I hope it was elucidating for some, interesting for all. And I wanna thank you very much for your time as always. We'll be seeing you next month with a new topic. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.